Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel. Well, today we're gonna, um, today's the first event. We're having a series this spring, in case you didn't know, um, about this book, Justice, by Michael Sandel. It was on PBS. We're gonna show some, some of the episodes on Sundays, five Sundays, one in January through May. There's little flyers in the back. And then we're gonna discuss the topic, and it'll be um, led by one of the library staff. I think a different librarian will be the facilitator, and so far over 30 people have signed up, so people are interested in philosophy. Um, so today, Professor San Paul Santilli is from over at Siena. If you read our flyer, he's um, been over there for 20-something years. He, he has a long list of things which I won't read, but you can get a flyer in the back. But I would like to say he does use this book in his classes over at Siena, so we've got the perfect guy to talk about it. So here's Paul Santilli from Siena College's um, philosophy department. Thank you. Mm. Thank you, John. Um, so uh, I've been actually teaching closer to 30 years at oh, okay. Siena College. And, uh, I must, and I go by this library uh, almost every day on my way back to home to Niskayuna. But this is the first time I've ever been in here, so um, I'm somewhat embarrassed to say that, but I'm glad I have stopped in on this occasion. Uh, so uh, perhaps I shouldn't say this, but uh, I, if you've never been to Siena College, um, I'd like to invite you to go over there, too, uh, uh, since I've come here. Um, and uh, those of you who will be inspired by the talk today and the philosophical discussion in the weeks to come may be interested to know that we have um, actually a former colleague of Michael Sandel uh, at Harvard. Uh, his name is Anthony Appiah. He's now at Princeton. He's coming to Siena on March uh, 29th to give a public lecture. And I'm going to leave this uh, poster here at the library so you can see uh, what we have. It's part of our very uh, I think prestigious uh, symposium on living philosophers. We try to get some of the best philosophers in the country to uh, come to Siena College. Well, um, I hope you haven't had a chance to read the Latham Life yet today, uh, because my whole talk is in here. Uh, uh, I, there was a reporter from the Troy Record who shot me an email and asked me a few questions, and I, I shot her uh, kind of a narrative about the book on justice, and uh, she printed it word for word. So, uh, uh, so there wouldn't be too many surprises if you've read it uh, in what I have to say. Uh, it turns out that the speaker I, uh, that's coming to Siena is going to speak on honor. He uh, is a philosopher who writes on honor. And uh, maybe that's a, a good way to begin uh, with the uh, very idea of honor. It is one of the topics that's in this book, uh, Justice, uh, by Michael Sandel. And, um, and he gives it uh, some attention, and uh, so will uh, appear. Uh, honor, along with uh, related ideas, such as virtue and character, are, are one of several basic ideas that Michael Sandel thinks underlie uh, all our political debates in this country. Um, in his view, uh, while the discussion, as in the current campaign, often um, is, is focused on technical issues or issues of economics, job creation, debt reduction, health care reform, and so forth, um, just below the surface, there are some fundamental moral philosophical uh, notions um, that don't get mentioned as much, don't get discussed as much, and and honor is is one of these um, one of these ideas. Um, perhaps you have heard uh, this past week of the uh, 
somewhat uh, obnoxious story of uh, four Marines who uh, urinated uh, or uh, were videotaped and apparently did urinate on the body of three uh, dead Taliban fighters um, in a way such as to mock the dead. Uh, and this has stirred up uh, a little controversy. I think uh, Governor Rick Perry uh, referred to it at one point. Um, and uh, it's interesting to read some of the uh, responses to this, uh, particularly on the part of the military uh, and on the part of uh, fellow Marines. And uh, one of the comments that is made is that this is a dishonor. This dishonors the Marines, right? That this is dishonors the, uh, the fighting men here. And that, that is then a kind of moral uh, perception. That's a moral objection to what the Marines did. Uh, and that's uh, laid out there um, by the military itself. One of the um, interesting and, and uh, sort of uh, fun things that Sandel does in this book is um, he comes up with uh, incidents that are not so serious or profound, perhaps, as, as the Marines. Uh, one example uh, concerns a cheerleader named uh, Carrie Smart in Texas. Um, she was a member of the JV cheerleading team, uh, but it turns out she has, from birth, cerebral palsy. Right? So she had to, uh, she was confined to a wheelchair and she couldn't perform the acrobatic moves uh, like the other girls on the cheer team. Uh, but she had a lot of spunk and a lot of personality and everyone liked her and so forth. Well, some of the parents of the other cheerleaders uh, started raising a fuss um, and they pressured the school to have cheerleader tryouts, right, to see who would make the team. Uh, guaranteeing, of course, that uh, Carrie would not make the team. Uh, and when asked why, they came up with certain kinds of excuses like, well, uh, it's dangerous for her to be on the sidelines because one of the football players might knock her over. Um, the, the other cheerleaders always have to be concerned about her and not distracted and so forth and so on. Um, but Sandel observes uh, that really what underlies this concern about Carrie Smart being a, a cheerleader is something like honor, right? That is, if cheerleading is just a matter of personality uh, and enthusiasm, then, it, then the whole athletic aspect of cheerleading, the, the physical, gymnastic, acrobatic abilities that cheerleaders display doesn't count for much, right? So uh, the objection to her cheerleading turns out to be an objection rooted in honor, right? So, the idea of honor as part of our moral culture um, is something that when you hear it, you say, yeah, I, I think it's important to be honorable, to have good character, to have what the uh, philosopher would call virtue. Um, but it's um, not always on the table. It almost seems like in America that when we start talking about things like virtue and honor, uh, we're sort of stepping into a private area, maybe even a religious area, and that doesn't seem like that should be part of our public language, our public discourse. But Sandel, in his book and in the video series that some of you will be watching, um, believes quite differently. He, he thinks that our politics, our debates, uh, our discussions will be enriched if we put our moral cards on the table, if we think explicitly about the moral principles um, that we subscribe to. So honor and virtue and character is sort of one set that he talks about uh, in this book. And he gives enough background that he goes back to the great Greek philosopher uh, Aristotle. Um, and uh, so if you read this book, uh, you actually learn Aristotle from a Harvard professor um, in a way that I think is pretty clear, but um, certainly does challenge you to stretch your mind a bit. Well, what are some of the other moral ideas that he speaks about in this book? Um, fundamentally, there are two other ones. And to get at one of them, I'll tell you about my first visit to Florida this past winter. I went to Naples. Some of you may have been there. 
my wife and I, maybe it's a sign that we're getting older, we said we're going to Florida um, and loved it. You know, loved the sunshine, loved Naples. But when we were down there, we took this boat cruise to a part of Naples, Florida called Port Royal. Um, and um, Port Royal turns out to be uh, a bastion of wealth that I have never seen, even in Loudonville before. Um, my hero, Larry Bird, had a house down there, and we cruised right by it. Um, people from Fortune 500 companies are building places that they stay for a couple of weeks, you know, when it's cold during the winter, and then they, they go somewhere else. So uh, while I'm enjoying the cruise, I'm also thinking, like a philosopher, about this wealth. And as you know from the Occupy movement and the, and the brouhaha that that's uh, stirred up, um, there's a concern, of course, about the gap between the rich and the poor, right? The extreme wealth that I saw there in Naples and, of course, the other so-called 99%. Um, Is, is that wealth deserved? Do the people who have those homes, uh, uh, do they have it because of their own merit? Right? Uh, does it come to them because they are good? Um, and is it something like character and honor that feeds the riches that way? Uh, my own view is with, uh, with Warren Buffett's. Where he says it's not pluck, it's luck that, uh, that generates this kind of wealth, right? Uh, sure, people don't necessarily deserve these things. It's not because they have virtue or character or some kind of extraordinary merit. Um, they do well in the market, right? The market generates wealth, um, often by mechanisms that nobody really understands. Um, but is there a moral idea underlying the acquisition of great wealth? This brings us to the second great moral idea that we find in Sandel's book, and that's liberty, or um, what one great philosopher, Robert Nozick, another colleague of Sandel's at Harvard, called um, the entitlement view of justice. Those people with those big homes and yachts, they're entitled to it, right? That underlying uh, this wealth and these, these gaps in wealth is a moral idea that if somebody acquires something justly, right, uh, through the exercise of their own freedom, no one can take it away from them, right? No one can deprive them of what they have by right. Um, do so, as um, the philosopher Nozick would say, is a kind of theft, is a kind of taking um, of what um, is rightfully theirs. It is not rightfully theirs because they deserve it. Right? It is rightly theirs because they are entitled to it. Right? They acquire it freely. Freedom is a big moral idea. We obviously use that word a lot, freedom and liberty. But it's sort of, again, like honor, lurks below the surface, right? We're not sure um, how always to define freedom or liberty, right? It has good punch in our political rhetoric, but what exactly does it mean? Sandel's book, Justice, probes this a bit, probes particularly what he calls the libertarian philosophy, um, that um, for Americans at least, Equal liberty is sacrosanct, and if you have liberty, you are going to have inequality. Right? Liberty generates inequality. As long as people are free to spend their money, to make investments, to acquire things, um, we will have gaps. There will be discrepancies in wealth. Some will do well, some will do badly. Liberty is an important moral idea, but it doesn't always square with honor, right? It doesn't always match up with what we think is morally right or just. Going along with liberty is um, a complementary idea 
Sandel in his book puts them together, but I think they should be separate. But the other moral idea that we believe in as Americans, I think, is equality. Right? We think that fairness and justice require also a sense of equality. Okay? But how do you ensure equality without intruding on liberty? Right? Um, if people are free, they are free to expend money and become poor. If people are free, they are free to acquire money and become rich, right? Um, you, can't, you can't bring about equality uh, in this society without intruding upon liberty. Too much inequality is bad, all right? So I think uh, politically, uh, we have to worry about equality, um, but we also have to realize what we're doing when we try to equalize chances for Americans, uh, resources for Americans, health care, that we are, in fact, squeezing out another important idea, namely liberty. Again, Sandel doesn't tell us in his book or in his videotape what is the right thing to do, although that is the title, right? Justice, what is the right thing to do? Um, but rather says that we Americans, particularly in our political discussions, um, need to recognize that there are these tensions in our moral assumptions. And when they shape our beliefs about what is to be done about illegal immigration or health care or job creation, um, we should be a little more conscious about what moral standards we are applying. So honor, liberty, equality. Okay. The idea of virtue, libertarian, egalitarian thought, part of the moral beliefs that shape our society um, and influence whether we are aware of it or not are political debates. Sandel would like us to get that onto the table and debate them, not just technical issues, not just economic issues. There's one more um, great idea that you find in this book and Sandel devotes some time to. Um, one more important value, you might say, that as Americans, I think, we believe in um, and shape our sense of uh, a good society. And that is the idea of happiness. Right? The idea that in our policy, in our programs, uh, in our laws, we should try to promote the overall welfare, the overall good of people in our society to maximize as much, as many interests as we can. Right? We can't satisfy everybody, but a good society is one with a pretty good happiness quotient, right? Which, which country always gets ranked with the happiness quotient? It's always like a Scandinavian country, you know? Which I don't believe, I, I frankly. Uh, I mean, they're cold, it's gray. I read these, uh, these, these novels from, you know, from Sweden, uh, you know, you know, girl with a dragon tattoo. These don't look like happy people to me. Uh, so, uh, but they always get ranked high uh, with, the, uh, with the happiness quotient. Um, and that's important that we think about that. Um, we think about making people happy. Um, now, happiness is a moral idea, right? Um, it, there's a long tradition of thinking about happiness in an ethical way. It's, it has a technical name. It's called utilitarianism, right? I, I can say those things, utilitarianism. Um, it, it goes back to the uh, British philosopher John Stuart Mill, and there's a chapter in um, Sandel's book on utilitarianism. Um, a good policy, a moral decision-making is one which promotes the greatest good for the greatest number, right? Increases the overall satisfaction of society and minimizes suffering, right? And surely that influences our political beliefs, our thinking about our own society. Um, 
and it infiltrates many of the debates, right? Just take one. I don't think this is one that um, Sandel devotes a lot of attention to, but it's a, it's a good one to think about. Um, and that is sort of end of life issues, right? Where as one gets older and one suffers from illness and debilitation, um, the quality of life, some people would say, um, diminishes, right? Uh, that raises the question, what is a quality of life? What defines happiness? What makes for a good, satisfying life? Um, in social policy, having to do now with the need for more assisted living homes, more nursing homes, uh, more drugs, more access to drugs and medicines. Um, uh, how do you relieve suffering? How do you help people not suffer so much um, but recognize when you do this, there's also another cost, right? Somebody has to pay for that. Um, doesn't that also diminish the happiness and the prospects of the young uh, who may be taxed more heavily, let's say, to um, take care of the elderly? No one has the answer to, the, to these tough kinds of questions, but often they get addressed or in the heat of debate and disagreement um, there is kind of a reluctance sometimes to just reflect on a very simple, very quiet question, which is, uh, what does it mean to be happy? Um, what, is, what for a human being is really um, a positive step in one's welfare? What about society as a whole? What, what, what makes a good society? Um, I think we are reluctant to ask these questions because, again, we think that they are just private and personal, unanswerable, um, and maybe so, right? But wouldn't it be nice um, in, in the debates this week in South Carolina if some of these candidates were saying to one another, uh, well, Milk, what do you think happiness is, right? Uh, uh, Ron, you know, um, how do we achieve the greatest good for the greatest number, right? Uh, instead of fussing about tax returns and all that stuff, right? Um, I would like to see that. I think Michael Sandel would like to see that kind of discussion. We're naive professors, of course, but, um, but you know, uh, Sandel's book has attracted a great deal of attention. I don't know if you know this, but Michael Sandel, the author, has been on Charlie Rose. He's been invited and has appeared on the Colbert Report. I'm not making this up. If you ever want to see something pretty hilarious, watch a Harvard professor engage with Steve Colbert. Um, this, is, this doesn't happen to philosophers, right? Um, uh, we, we just don't leave the ivory tower. Uh, but Michael Sandel has done this. Um, his book is a bestseller in China and Japan, right? suggesting that this hunger to talk about things like honor and happiness and liberty and equality is not confined simply to universities or even to the United States, but around the world. Um, in part, it's because, as you will see, um, these ideas are linked now through the web, right, through videocast. And you will be able to watch um, a Harvard professor interact with his students uh, at a beautiful place, I don't know if you've ever been to Cambridge, Massachusetts, and seen Sanders Hall. It's a, it's a lovely old building, you know, full of wood. Um, and you see Sandel talking and engaging as a teacher with a thousand students, right? I am so envious. Right? He gets a thousand students to his philosophy course. You know, I have to drum the halls of Siena to try to drag in a few uh, to you know, get enough to make the course go. So anyway, um, and so it's a rich process uh, 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 where young people, of course, um, are thinking about these things. But the fact that this book it has been a bestseller, um, the fact that you here are here and may pursue this for the next month or so um, is a sign that there is a kind of call, a feeling that the level of debate, the level of rhetoric in this country um, has to not just be more civil, which is what's been said a lot, um, but has to rise to another level where we, we really see that underlying the technical questions, the economic questions, um, there may be more fundamental questions about 
justice and morality and human rights. Um, and and uh, I think this book allows us to reflect on that and throw some light on that. And I think I'm, I think I'm done. And so I guess it's the idea is we could have some uh, discussion. Well, I don't think I'm too many people, but yeah. so if you ask a question, if you stand, so everyone can hear, we would have a problem with some time here. Does anyone have a question for, for a comment? <laughs> if you don't, I'll call on you. I mean, I'm a teacher. <laughs> What's that? When, when do you teach this class at Sienna? Um, about every every other semester. Yeah, I, I use this book. Um, I have for several years. I, I have my students watch the video, so they can see that they're pretty smart too. Like this, you know, the Harvard students. They they're sort of surprised that they 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 have better questions sometimes. Um, I use the heavy stuff here too. These these are primary texts. So here you get your Aristotle, your Kant. You know some contemporary thinkers, and it's it's tough going, um, and I you know I work with students to help them with that. But I've done that. I do that about every other semester. I think there was a question back there for us. It was more of a comment, and it, it was oh, you yeah. want us to stand? I'm sorry. The Marines and the horrible you know thing they did with the urinating on dead people, and then apparently thinking it was acceptable because they videotaped. Okay, sure. so this is outrageous. But I, I find it interesting that the level of outrage uh, and the frequency of it is expressed about this, what they horribly did to dead people, it, it's not as much outrage as we express about what they're regularly doing to living people there and people they're killing and what they're doing to civilians and to the whole country. So, <laughs> there was another um, question here, I think. Um, I don't know how to put this. I just find that there seems to be almost like a trivialization of virtue, honesty, and we see it every day, you know, in the news where you accept things that people have done and people just go forward. You know, I mean, one case is like when I was in Washington with Mayor Barry. He did all these bad things like a lot of other politicians. And people accept it. It's okay, and they move on. I mean, what's happened? Right. Um, a lot of it, I think a lot of that is, is it, well, we can blame, I think, courts and philosophers, too. I mean, um, one prevailing view uh, is that character, virtue, taste are private matters, right? And when we get into the public arena, we have to be neutral, right? So um, politics and law, uh, economics, policy making, taxation, is not about character and taste, right? But a kind of a neutral gray area, right? Um, which you can sort of calculate and enumerate. Uh, and and the, part of the reason is that people believe that you can't really rationally talk about character. It's just too private, too pluralistic, too diverse, too many different kinds of groups, too many different kinds of series. I disagree with that, right? I, I disagree that you can discuss these things and you can be disgusted by these things. Yes? I agree with your comment on the Scandinavian countries. I was there for four years in Oslo, Norway. And the people began to know me enough to ask me questions. And they would say, why do Americans smile all the time? And I said, well, because they're happy. Why? <laughs> and then they would say, when you meet someone and you say, I'm pleased to meet you, how do you know? <laughs> and I began to search myself as to the answers to these questions. Right. I, having been to Naples, I, I will say sun. I mean, it's just, it's just sun, just smile. Come back to Albany, grumpy. Yes? I wonder if you have any examples of nations or cultures that do have this course and talk about some of these issues of character. Well, um, of course, our own country in the early days, all right, the time of the revolution. Um, and uh, even into the 1800s, uh, very much so, um, had uh, 
public discussions of virtue and character and honor. Um, ben Franklin famously wrote a book on the virtues and self-improvement and, 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 and means of doing this sort of thing. So um, we have a history of doing that in our own country. It, I think it's, it's really the 20th century that gradually, gradually sort of purged that from our public discourse. Um, ironically, um, religion has been part of the problem. Uh, that is, religion in a way makes it seem that the church makes it seem that it has a monopoly on this discussion, right? Um, and, and, and therefore it made it harder for Americans to, to understand that no, um, that this, whether you're a churchgoer or not, you know, these are important issues, all right? Uh, whether, you, whether you think, for instance, abortion is morally right or morally wrong, properly legal or properly criminal, right? Um, the discussion about virtue and character it still can be asked, still can be raised, right? Um, but we sort of shy away with this, and I think uh, we didn't always have that history. Beyond that, I think, um, you know, I think public discussion in liberal democratic countries um, of virtue and morality has been fairly rare. Um, but um, post-war Germany, for instance, had to have these discussions, right, because of what happened. So you, you, see, you did see that much more. You see, you see a moral language even in the German constitution, for instance. Uh, but like other liberal democracies in recent times, uh, no, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't hold up another country as a better example of this. I think I'll go to this side, yes. Um, I think I have a pretty good idea of where it started ending with morality, virtue, honesty. Um, I went to school in the junior high and high school in the 60s. And I went to a public school that was like going to a private school. It was in Sheep's Head Bay in Brooklyn. It was a great school that is now closed. I had excellent teachers. And, um, and some of them I'm still in contact with now. They're in their 80s, but so on. And we studied Ben Franklin. We studied Thomas Jefferson. We, I mean, I had a, I had a, a social studies class that Mr. Brown started with Aristotle. And he threw in a little Plato because he was an Aristotelian, not a Plato. So. And, um, <laughs> and then something happened. Lawyers, lawsuits, I hate to say this for all you people sitting here, ACLU had stopped a lot of this. Universities started cutting out core courses, the, the core of understanding philosophy and talking about it. And people were afraid. And there's a lot of nasty stuff that came out of the legal profession. People who wanted equality, you couldn't say things. Freedom now was, I mean, you had to zip your mouth. You had to be very careful what you said. And this is a very sad thing. And I think this is where it's coming. And then the universities, no offense to you, but um, you know, I'm sure you've seen it as well. Um, well my friend, daughter goes to college, yeah. um, she graduated. But where's the core courses? She comes back, she says, <laughs> you know, where is this stuff? I can't have a conversation with her. Well, it's, you know, it's, it's about it's about citizenship ultimately. And I think that's Sandel's deepest interest. And he is he is a political philosopher. He's not you know, he is, he says, he says he's a CNN junkie, right? He, he really is interested in citizenship. So this is not about morality just for the sake of morality. No, it's the subject of it. Yeah, and, and, and citizenship is not just restricted to educated people. Um, you know, if you see the Ken Burns series, you know, about the Civil War and so forth, you recognize that uh, people who didn't go to universities uh, had a moral language, and, and they knew how to use it, and they knew what honor was, and they knew what character was. Um, but of course, as we got more educated, um, we do need books um, in our society, but I think we're slipping on not just the core courses, but I, I could see this even at, at Siena, you know, that we don't teach the great novels anymore, where you, you know, the, the Jane Austens, you know, these are big books. Who has time to read these things? Um, right. And, uh, uh, you know, and, and there you would learn, just Jane Austen alone, you could just read Jane Austen and you would learn about character and virtue and social interaction. 
would that make you a better voter? Yes, that's, <laughs> it would. Uh, read Jane Austen, you'd be a better voter. Um, if our politicians read Jane Austen, would they speak better? Yes. Right? Uh, so, uh, but, we're, but uh, in a way I'm agreeing, we've, we've lost that as a culture, as, as a society. So I, myself, that's part of it, I think. Uh, to go over this side, thank you, yes. Uh, I was just delighted with the, the, your whole talk because it seemed to me, as I was, I just uh, completed uh, reading the book about the beginning of, of, of the United States of America, uh, uh, through the Declaration of Independence, the Old War, and all, uh, 1776, and all of that, and up through the Constitution. And it seemed to me that you were uh, quoting the Declaration of Independence almost in some of the ways of equality and happiness and all this. And I thought, my goodness, so this is exciting. And then the other thing that I, I uh, at the end of the same book, I wanted to make one other comment, that at the very end of the book, the author says that our Constitution will need continual revision as long as any man is less free than another. And I thought that is that is that is a wonderful statement, and uh, I think fits in with your talking about the political discussions and things that are going on today. But I do think we should revisit revisit the Declaration. Yeah, no, that's a that was a beautiful statement. Thank you for that. Yes, back there. Yeah. If, uh, take the issue of abortion, uh, which, from the point of view of someone who's anti. It's murder, and the egg, fertilized egg, is a human being. In fact, there's a bill in now to make that a law, and that getting aborting a fertilized egg is murder. The people who believe that, a lot of them are atheists and Catholic and everything, are right, whatever, they're right on moral grounds, they're right on liberty grounds, you're killing innocent human beings. The person who disagrees with that say, well, fertilized egg isn't a person, and basically you'll do away with much harm by aborting it. Now, any philosophical argument, I believe in this case, in Reed Santa, won't change anyone's mind because basically they're convinced and they're right if you grant their basic premise. It's murder. The person who disagrees with it and say, well, isn't it? So how would even an uh, argument to someone who's will make a political party out of just the right to life party be changed? Because he's right. And so is the other. So if both sides believe in liberty and justice, so I don't see how a discussion will change either side. That's my question. I, I think uh, you know, that's the difficulty of being a philosopher, um, <laughs> that uh, you say, OK, talk better, think better, um, use those words, and then you still believe the same thing you did before, right? Um, we, always, we always have a hope that this kind of self-reflection, being much more aware of what underlies your beliefs, doesn't necessarily change those beliefs, may make them stronger, um, but you live with others in a society, right? And in civil discussion, civil disagreement is good. It's, it's healthy in a democracy, rather than ranting and raving. Um, so I would say that that's one benefit of that kind of self-reflective process. There's always the possibility that when you think it through, you might, you might change your mind. Um, and, um, and you become aware, I think, of why the other people believe what they do too. Right? You become not tolerant for the act, if you, if you, if you disagree with it, but you become tolerant for the, the goodness of the one who disagrees with you. Um, so those are the kinds of answers I would give what I, to what I think is a tough, a tough question, ultimately. Um, Yes. Hi, I just have a little comment, and that's that I had the privilege of um, auditing two Siena courses, and um, I thought it was very interesting to get uh, an older person's perspective in the group of young. <laughs> no, I don't mean you. Uh -huh. I mean me. Um, the the first course was. Um, a lot of seniors ordered it. It was a peace building through the arts course. The second course was a creative writing, and I was the only old person in the classroom. It was very, um, the first day in the classroom, I thought the instructor was going to say, ma'am, are you looking for the ladies' room? You know, I looked so out of place. But um, I do think that from, from this angle of life, I brought a different perspective to the class, and I just wondered if 
you had any seniors that audited your class, and if not, maybe I or someone else would want to audit your class sometime. And um, it, they only allow you to audit um, if your class is full, and also um, it, you have to be over a certain age, which I think is 60. Uh, well, I, I first of all would say I would welcome anyone to audit my class or any class at Siena College. I think Siena tries to be a good neighbor, um, and, and uh, Franciscan College is welcoming of anyone um, who uh, wants to participate of the education. So um, I certainly would do that. Um, I did, <laughs> it's funny uh, you mentioned that, because I did teach a seminar last spring on the Crimes Against Humanity, and it was a small honors level seminar. And so uh, I had my list, and a, into the room comes this guy, you know, who's older, maybe 50s, sort of not well-dressed, you know. Uh, he was African-American, and he kind of comes in, and I had the same reaction, like, what are you doing here? Uh, you, you can't be here. I didn't say that, but basically that was my feelings, and I was a little nervous, right? Well, what is this? Um, and talk about ethical self-reflection you know, and, and, and sort of embarrassment of yourself. Turns out he was brilliant, an ex-GI, smart as anything, stayed the whole semester, came to my house with the others where we sat around a fire and talked about these things. Um, but I never forgot that initial, that initial reaction uh, that shows you even ethics professors can be unethical <laughs> <laughs> and need to reflect uh, a little bit on what they were doing. Um, so uh, that's been basically one experience that comes to mind of having an older person whom our students respected and learned from, um, especially when he spoke about things like torture and um, crimes against humanity. Yes. Yeah, I, I just one comment, and it's uh, when we say that uh, smiling means happiness. Usually, I don't think that's correct. It's more or less your conditioning, whether you smile a lot or you don't. If you laugh and smile, that doesn't necessarily you are happy and peaceful. That's just, just a side comment. I'm glad to hear that. My wife thinks I don't <laughs> smile. <at her. laughs> I am happy. Yeah. But you know, there are studies that show that even if you're not happy, if you smile, you will become happier. I mean, this, experimentally, right? That having the expression first creates the emotion, creates the feeling. Um, Partially true. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I just wanted to kind of make a comment on liberty, justice, and pursuit of happiness. I guess I'm not sure all of us come from the same, we, we don't come from the same place. So I'm not sure the definitions of those words. So where are you coming from when you say liberty, justice, and? What, what's the last word? Well, pursuit of happiness. Yeah. yeah. Where are you coming from? How do you define those words? Because each one of us in our own mind, and that's why this debate. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So I'm just wondering where do you come from? Personally, yes. on the question of virtue and happiness. Um, I am what I would call an Aristotelian, right? That I, I think that happiness is not an inner feeling. It's not satisfaction. It is to live a flourishing life, to be active, to exercise your talents with others. There is no happiness in isolation, right? There's no, happiness is not the inner satisfaction of a tranquil soul. Right? Happiness is to be actively engaged um, in a good community. Virtue are those qualities that allow you to do that, right? Virtue are those characteristics of courage, justice, mercy, friendship, which allow you to engage uh, in a very active, interesting life. But as I always tell my students, that takes time. And I say to them, none of you are happy. Of course, this generates that kind of reaction. Uh, I said, because you haven't developed yet, right? You are not engaged enough. You may have a lot of fun, more than I do, 
by I'm happier than you. Uh, that gets them going. <laughs> but I, you know, as a, as a general quick answer to your question, I hope that helps. Thank you. You know, I, you said virtues and it sparks something. I read uh, William Bennett's The Book of Virtues. Do you ever use that in your class? Because every short story has something to do with virtue, honesty, integrity. Yes, yes. Um, I used to teach those short stories a lot more than I, I do now. There's some, there's some great ones. Stephen Crane, for instance, has some, some good stories. Um, F Ventures of Huckleberry Finn uh, will, will sort of resonate, too, with some of that. Um, but I you know, found this book, and um, I, I've sort of gravitated more to legal examples and um, other kinds of things rather than literature. Uh, but I started off as, as literature. Um, give you one more example, maybe, and uh, uh, I, yeah, wrap it up. Um, it's in Sandell's book. Um, Casey Casey Martin was a golfer, a professional level golfer, uh, but he had a leg problem, and uh, and he and he petitioned the PGA to use a golf cart uh, on the um, on the PGA tour, right? Well, you can't do that. Um, that walking the golf course is part, uh, presumably, of the competition uh, at, that, at that level. At lower levels, you, you can do it. You can, you can use a golf cart. But um, at, the, at this PGA um, senior tours, or not senior, but the regular tours, you, can, you can't do that. Um, well, he, he fought it in the courts, and it went all the way to the Supreme Court, right? Um, and all the way to the Supreme Court. And it's, it's wonderful to see how this is summarized in um, Sandel's book. You have people like Justice Antonin Scalia um, saying that you cannot define golf, right? Um, and you have other justices saying, well, golf must include walking. After all, Mark Twain said that golf is a good walk spoiled, so therefore uh, you have to, be able, have to be able to walk. And once again, to close it um, with the way I began it, that this com comes back down to some fundamental moral issues, questions of honor, that is, that golfers realize that if, if they don't walk and that golf is just hitting a little ball, they're not athletes, right? That they're always a little sensitive about that anyway. Um, so that um, this, this idea that what brings honor and glory to you um, underlies even something uh, simple like this dispute of whether someone with this kind of disability should be allowed to have a golf cart. It's, it's that kind of thing that you find in the book. It, it, what fascinates me It's why I, I enjoy teaching it to my students and uh, really have enjoyed talking with you today. Thank you. <laughs>